let's talk now about laboratory-based safety equipment. Most important of these is the fume hood. It's designed to remove toxic fumes. So if you can work inside the fume hood, please do so. That minimizes everybody's exposure to noxious chemicals. We have a very simple rule in the lab. You make a mess, you get to clean it up. So if you have a water flood, we have a mop that you can remove the puddle from the floor with. Then again, there's broken glass. If you break glassware, get the dustpan and brush from under the sink. Go to the broken glass container, which is under the sink. Bring the green broken glass bucket to the site along with the dustpan and brush. Brush all the debris <coughs> into the pan and put it inside the container. Don't use your fingers to pick up the shrapnel. One of the best ways to avoid problems with waste chemicals is to make sure that you put them in the right waste container. These are carefully labeled. Make sure that when you're disposing of something, you're putting it into the correct disposal place. This is an aqueous solution, so it doesn't go into either of the organic ones, but rather into this aqueous waste container, like that. Likewise, there are fill lines on all of them. Do not fill them above the, t the shoulder of the bottle because there needs to be space for expansion. If you're careful with waste disposal, then the dangers associated with incompatible chemicals reacting or spilling is minimized. When you have a hazardous chemical being dispensed, please take care with how you're doing the dispensing. Here we've got some concentrated sulfuric acid inside a dropper bottle. It's inside a container which is in turn inside the tray in the fume hood. Don't bring it out and dispense it out here. Gravity being what it is, it will fall on the floor. If you do have a spill, please let the people around you know because sometimes they look exactly like water and the person behind you doesn't know that that spilled chemical is dangerous because they don't know what it is. So please be very aware of what is happening when you are dispensing all chemicals, but particularly hazardous ones, to minimize everybody's exposure. I'd like to talk about specific dangers and hazards that you may be faced with in the lab. And the most dramatic of those is fire. If the fire alarm goes, uh, sounds rather, in the Lashmiller building, that is a continuously ringing bell. In the Wahlberg, it's a, an electronic beeping sound. If the fire alarm sounds, then please turn off all sources of heat and water if you can. Leave the lab and leave the building by the nearest stairwell. Do not use elevators. Go outside the building and remain outside until the fire alarm has stopped ringing and you are told that it is safe to return to the building. If there is a fire, people tend to panic. We get the bunny in the headlights reaction. And it is very helpful if you are not in the bunny in the headlights situation, if you can help somebody who is. If somebody causes an accident, frequently they will freeze. If, for instance, somebody catches fire, that is their lab coat or their hair for some reason is in flames, they may not know what to do. Please, if they're in that situation, tell them. Speak loudly to them. It may need to uh, penetrate their consciousness. If you or anyone else has clothing on fire, the rule is stop, drop, and roll. By rolling on the ground, you will smother the flames that are happening. An example of that bunny in the headlights freeze reaction comes exactly from this. We used to say, roll on the ground. There is a documented case of someone who caused a fire, their lab coat was in flames, and what was pounding in their head was, roll on the ground, roll on the ground. And so they ran out of the lab, down three flights of stairs and outside so that they could roll on the grass. Uh, I am here to tell you that vinyl floor tiles do just as good a job at smothering flames as grass does. And the floor tiles are just as close as your feet. So the rule is now 
stop, drop, and roll, rather than running around outside, causing yourself more injury. If a fire starts and you are nearby, then take the initiative and sound the alarm. Say fire in a loud, clear voice so that the people around you are alerted. If it's in a fume hood, close the door. If you feel comfortable, get a fire extinguisher. If not, get out of the way. If there is a fire on equipment and you feel comfortable to do this, then there are fire extinguishers and they are always next to the fire exits. You should know where the exits are. The extinguishers within a lab will always be the appropriate kind and they are like this. They'll be hanging in a bracket and there is a pin. The rule for fire extinguishers is PASS, P-A-S-S. -S. And that is for pull the pin, aim, and sweep from side to side. Pull the pin, aim at the base of the flame, not at the flames themselves, squeeze the handle, which will cause the extinguisher to discharge its extinguishing material, and sweep the hose from side to side so that you will damp out the fire wherever it is. If there is a problem, do not use more than one extinguisher. If it's more than that, leave it to the professionals, and get out. If you don't feel comfortable using one of these, just get out. Leave by the fire exits and pull the fire alarm. There will always be a fire alarm pull station next to one of the exits. One other rule, never use a fire extinguisher on a human being. They're only to be used on equipment. Uh, for humans, the rule is stop, drop, and roll. But again, if you don't feel comfortable, get out of the way of the fire, close the fume hood door if that's where it is, and leave the problem to the professionals. Rather less dramatic than a fire is a chemical spill. Now, the worst kind is a spill on a human, and the most serious chemical is a chemical splash in the eye. Now, this will never happen because you're always going to be wearing eye protection, but just in case, if splash happens into your eye, get to an eye wash. Now, if this happens to you, your eyes will have closed, so you'll be weeping and you will not be able to see. Call for help in a loud, clear voice. If you are nearby, please assist. Help them to find the eye wash, hold the person by the shoulders and walk them to the nearest eye wash. Grab the eye wash nozzle and activate it. Hold the victim's head in place. Call for staff help and the eye wash needs to continue for 15 minutes. If the spill is of a corrosive chemical and there's a large amount on your body, get to a safety shower. Pull the handle and get the affected clothing out of the way. This is not a time for modesty, just pull the garments off. Almost all of the time, the spill will not be serious enough to require a safety shower. If it's on your hand or your arm, generally speaking, the best cure is water and lots of it. Just put the afflicted part under the tap and turn it on, and that will wash the chemical away. If the spill has not actually hit a human being, then how do you clean it up? If the spill is small, that is, it's not particularly corrosive and it's less than 500 mils, if you can pick it up with four paper towels, do so. Bring the paper towels to the sink, wash them off, and then throw them in the paper garbage. If the spill is large, you should call for assistance and also make sure that the people around you don't walk into the puddle that you have just created. There is a spill kit in the lab underneath the sink for just such an emergency. We've got bags of various things to neutralize it, and the kit contains disposal mechanisms that we'll talk about. If it is dilute acid or base, we use sodium bicarbonate, which will neutralize whether the acid or the base and chemically react with it and will then sweep up the mess. If it's an organic solvent, we use the adsorbent, which is remarkably like kitty litter, actually, and again, mop it up. Inside the kit, there are mopping up pads and also devices that can be used to form a dam around the puddle itself. These materials, once they have been dealt with, 
will be put into bags and disposed of as chemical waste. But if something this size is needed, call for staff assistance. This is rather a lot of safety rules that we have given you. But we want you to have these rules as second nature. And until they're second nature, we can all make mistakes. And I don't exempt myself from this. I tell this story to people to point out that even I, who have been doing this and teaching this for 30 years, also make mistakes. One summer, it was not in the teaching season, I had a summer student working on a particular experiment, which involved dissolving chemicals up in dilute acid. And I went to visit her in the lab, and I sort of leant up against the bench like this, except that I wasn't wearing a lab coat. And that evening, I happened to be going to a theater performance. And in the lobby, a friend of mine came up and said to me, do you realize that you have holes in your pants? And uh, no, I had not realized that. And it was certainly quite embarrassing. And I spent the rest of the evening in the lobby walking around like Prince Philip with my hands covering the holes in the butt of my pants. I say this to point out that even the professionals forget. Even the professionals aren't always thinking about safety. But the chemicals don't know if you are on duty or off duty. I was not actually working in the lab, and so it didn't occur to me to be wearing a lab coat and to worry about spills. But the chemicals ate through the butt of my pants anyway. And so here I am, uh, wandering around with holes in the butt of my pants. And uh, could I have been wearing gray underwear to match? Heck no, they were fire engine red, just like my face. I was embarrassed. I shouldn't have been, because I should have always been thinking about what happens. It wasn't ser serious in my case, but sometimes it can be. So do try and always remember the rules that we're teaching you are for your safety.